Today's feature is the Norfolk County Sheriff's Office, and joining me, fittingly, is the Norfolk County Sheriff, Jerry McDermott. Jerry, welcome. Pleasure. Mark, thanks so much for having me. I certainly welcome the opportunity. A first time not in this studio, but a first time chatting with me. That's right. Yeah, years ago, I think I was here about 12 years ago when I was the Executive Director of South Shore Habitat for Humanity. And uh, we were uh, doing some building here in Quincy, and uh, your uh, cable TV show, show was gracious enough to uh, have us on and talk about some of our fundraising efforts. Great. Uh, glad that we could be of service yeah. and of help. And uh, you and I uh, spoke a little bit about um, a potential for this program, for a sheriff's program. And That's on the terrific. past, we've had it under the uh, former sheriff, Michael Bellotti. Certainly, we welcome that again. That would be terrific. Yeah, there's so much going on. Uh, more than I think the public realizes, you know, the old days, the sheriff was pretty much the jailer, right? Uh, right. Bad guys did crime. They did the time. You lock them up. That was it. Uh, but there's so much more that goes on uh, up at the jail that we would, we'd welcome that opportunity to come in uh, periodically and uh, just talk a little bit about some of the programming we do. Excellent. Uh, talk a little bit about um, your appointment as sure. the sheriff, uh, just to give a little background. So it's uh, been about one year. Um, when I got the phone call from Governor Charlie Baker, and uh, as you mentioned, the former sheriff, Michael Bellotti, he was appointed um, president of Quincy College back around Columbus Day of uh, 2018. Right. And so there was an interim sheriff who did a great job, terrific guy named Bob Harnes, um, no stranger to the Quincy Braintree area. Not at all. And uh, then uh, I started about December 22nd of 2018, took over as sheriff. And that's to uh, fill the unexpired term of former Sheriff Bellotti. So in the 12 months mark, it's been terrific. Um, met a great group of talented people, uh, both corrections officers and folks uh, on the administrative side, uh, the medical and behavioral health team, uh, really dedicated individuals who are, who are doing a lot of God's work up there, trying to rehabilitate people. Um, some of the most interesting things I've seen in the 12 months, um, the shift that we're doing with uh, female inmates um, we'll probably get into that a little bit more in a, in a little bit, but uh, when I first took over sheriff, I was surprised that we only housed the men at the Dedham House of Correction, um, and the women were sent to MCI Framingham. Yeah, we can talk about that now. That's, yeah. uh, that's a perfect segue. Yeah, it's, uh, so it, it struck me that, um, you know, in this day and age, um, where we're very concerned, as we should be, about equity, um, that the men were being treated differently than the women. So. Uh, we have right now about 450 inmates up in Dedham at the Norfolk County House of Correction. But historically, about eight out of the 14 county sheriffs would send their female offenders to MCI Framingham to state DOC uh, care and custody. It's a much rougher, tougher place to do your time. Uh, many complaints from both inmates, their families, uh, and certainly their defense attorneys. Now, why that decision? Uh, the facilities weren't there for females. Okay. So uh, the, the facilities that we have right now, we would have to retrofit so that we could take female offenders. So what I did in short order was uh, we did a planning phase, realized that we, we couldn't take our female offenders back immediately. So I signed a memorandum of, of understanding with Sheriff Tompkins out of Suffolk. And uh, we moved our women out of MCI Framingham, so they're delighted about that, and their families are, moved them to uh, South Bay. And then eventually, we believe by April or May of 2020, we should have the facilities ready so that we can house our female offenders and certainly give them the same shot at rehabilitation and uh, other educational programs. And we should mention that the Dedham facility, there's quite a few inmates there. We're talking about numbers. And right. maybe talk about what it was built for and how it's had to adapt. Sure. So the facility opened in about 1991. It was built for 302 inmates. And right now, again, we've got about 450. But over the years, uh, talking with some of uh, the more seasoned folks that work with me, people that have been there almost 30 years um, in the corrections business, they, they've told me that at time they broke 700. That was the number of inmates. And the way they did it was they had, um, just picture plastic canoes uh, that were used as beds. And they'd put pillows and they'd give everyone a blanket. But during the day, they would stack those canoes up. And that's how they housed everybody. And they had three and four to a, to a cell. Um, so we still do have some uh, overcrowding in some of the cell, um, cell blocks, some of the housing units. Uh, but we can manage it. It's, it's not that bad with about 450 inmates. Um, and we have the Dedham Alternative Center, which has another 24 rooms. 
But talk, uh, I was going to say, talk about some of the rehabilitation programs. Sure. Um, so and how that kind of lessens the load, I suppose, in Dedham. Well, what we're seeing a lot is uh, the, the reason the numbers aren't as high as they used to be is um, the district attorney's office, uh, as well as the judges, the courts, are working to try to help um, get people into programming if jail's not the best place for them. Um, we have a huge opioid crisis, as you know, and we've got a terrific drug court here in Quincy. And people do try so that um, if male and female offenders are right for a program that might help them turn their life around, um, and they can deal with the mental health and the medical issues that they have, maybe that's the best way for them to get better, and they don't need to go to jail. Others, they're gonna end up in jail, and, and we, we know that. Um, but the numbers are down because of so many uh, diversion programs okay. that are out there. Now, as far as rehabilitation, when people come into our care and custody, 80% of them have a dual diagnosis of some mental health issue and uh, substance abuse disorder. Um, so they've got an addiction to heroin or pills uh, or alcohol. Um, those folks, we get them in, we uh, classify them, and we get them immediately into some programming so that we uh, can really help them turn their life around and get back on track because they're going to get out at the county level, Mark. Uh, the longest stay you're going to see is about two and a half years, but on average, folks are staying 114 days. Okay. You know, if that, some of them a little bit shorter. Right. Um, so in that short window of opportunity that somebody is in our care and custody, we've got to help them try to get clean and sober, uh, meet them where they're at on their education level, see if they've uh, got high school equivalency, are they college ready? Did they come in with a skill set? You know, maybe uh, they've got some culinary arts skills or some carpentry skills. Um, and we try to add to that and skill them up so that when they do go out, it's a successful reentry and they have a better shot at um, staying clean and sober and being productive and paying their own way. Uh, that's the goal. Um, it's, it's not easy in a short window of time. So with, with that said, um with the diversion programs that are in existence. The inmates that are currently in Dedham, how would you classify them? So uh, we have different classifications. Um, about two thirds of the inmate population right now is what we call pre-sentenced. So they're still waiting for the day before the judge to find out what their sentence will finally be. Okay. Uh, the other third are sentenced. Um, and, the, and those folks, um, some of them sadly have been in and out of the correction system and they've been in and out of jail before. Uh, we also house about 40 U.S. Marshal uh, inmates, and they're a little bit tougher caliber inmate, to be frank with you. Uh, we've, we've seen an uptick in MS-13 and Latin Kings, uh, and a credit to our Norfolk County Deputy Sheriffs, we were part of a multi-agency sweep uh, that you may have heard of called uh, Thrown Down, yes. uh, dethroning the Latin Kings. Right. We ended up with 11 of the Latin Kings, including their leader. Um, so... When we talk about corrections in jail, we always talk about the climate. And the climate is, how's, how's the tension? How's the atmosphere? Uh, is there an uptick in fights? Uh, do we see rival gangs eyeballing each other? Is there chatter that uh, you know, things could get you know, pretty serious in a hurry? So our corrections officers are really astute. And uh, a good corrections officer who's been there a while can sense uh, when the climate is heating up and when there could possibly be an altercation. And they can head it off. Um, so right now, we've got about 40 U.S. Marshal inmates. Um, we get about $107 per night for those inmates. Uh, that goes to the Commonwealth. We don't get to keep it. Um, but we make sure through our classification process that we're not mixing pre-sentenced uh, pre and sentenced populations. And then the, of those populations, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, you're not putting somebody in there who's, uh, you know, maybe they've got some uh, DUIs. Um, and, 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 you know, their, their issues, they're an alcoholic, right? And, right. and they've been hurting themselves and, uh, you know, they're trying to get clean and sober. And then you've got some MS-13 who are pretty hardened, maybe have some murders um, and some other hard uh, cases against them. We don't want them sharing a cell Understood. together, you know. Uh, we, we take the care, custody, and control of the inmates very seriously, and we have a duty to make sure that, you know, not only our corrections officers are safe, but we also have to make sure that people that are there doing their time are safe from one another. Agreed. Yeah. Talk about uh, an initiative that uh, you started, and that has to deal with uh, a deck of playing cards and how that uh, actually helps. Oh, sure. Helps you find 
folks that, um, well, actually helps you find criminals, helps you find potentially missing folks as well. So this program, Mark, started, um, I, I first learned of it back in about 2011. Uh, I was working for U.S. Senator Scott Brown at the time, and sadly a father came in and told me about how his son had been murdered down in New Orleans. And in Baton Rouge and New Orleans, there were so many unsolved murders, uh, the DA was overwhelmed, the DAs down there were overwhelmed. And eventually what they did was they came up with a deck of playing cards for that corrections, um, those corrections facilities. And on the deck of cards would be the faces of victims, of missing persons, um, just anything to do, or most wanted, anything to do with unsolved crime. Right. It took off from there. They now have it in South Carolina, Rhode Island. So uh, when I got the appointment to be sheriff, I thought, well, is anyone else doing this in Massachusetts, any other county? And we found out the answer was no. I do believe that the state is now looking at this uh, to take something like this statewide. But we initiated it in Norfolk County. Uh, the day of our press conference rolling out this deck of cards, one of the people on the deck of cards was arrested in Florida. And within a week, one of the guys in our housing unit, 2B, was on the deck of cards, and we said, okay, so there's another one. Excellent. Um, and the way it works in a nutshell is um, it, it's a standard deck of playing cards, but it has the faces of those unsolved crimes. Um, and on the reverse side is an anonymous tip line so that the inmates can give us information. Uh, no one's going to uh, punish them in the inmate population for being a snitch, if you will. Okay. Um, the other thing that's key, Mark, is uh, we have a great internal affairs division. And if you call up and you're an attorney and you want to speak to your, uh, your client who's an inmate, we'll tell you that uh, this line's being recorded and hang up a call a different number. So the inmates know that our lines are being recorded. That doesn't stop them. They love to talk. Okay. So what you may find is, you know, somebody that was in a, a gang is now doing time. Um, they see a crime on a deck of cards. They see somebody's face on a deck of cards. On their calls out, oh, they may start discussing it, and then you pick up tidbits of information. We've actually stopped a lot of drugs from being brought into the facility um, from those phone calls. Our internal affairs division works hand-in-hand -hand with Norfolk County DA Mike Morrissey's office. Um, when I first was on, within the first three months, we stopped $18,000 worth of Suboxone from uh, being smuggled in. So it's a, it's a very useful tool. Great, and I know this uh, program, again, is relatively new here in Norfolk County, yeah. but sounds like it's off to a great start. It is, and I think it's going to bear more fruit. Talk about domestic violence and the resources that the Sheriff's Office provides. Sure. So, uh, sadly, you know, domestic violence is rampant. Um, a lot of populations, a lot of cultures don't talk about it, and um, we want to do some something about it. So I've been working with our internal team and then meeting with uh, outside providers like Dove, and we're now putting all of Dove's flyers and pamphlets up in the lobby in Dedham. So what happens, Mark, typically is on the weekend um, or even during the week, you'll see a, a young mom with a toddler in tow coming up to put money on the account for an inmate. So we're housing the abusers, right? We, we're, we're, we've got the abusers in our care and custody. Right. Um, the, 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 the person being battered is almost afraid that if they don't come up and visit, if they don't come up and put money on the account, there could be a price to pay when this person gets out. So we want them to know as soon as they come into our facility, there's help. Uh, we typically have two female officers in the lobby, and now we have these flyers in uh, different languages from d uh, courtesy of Dove. And we, we have a victim's coordinator who also partners with um, DA Morrissey's victim advocate. So we want to do more in the future for uh, domestic violence. But um, we're also going to do some uh, training uh, so that women have self-defense classes. Um, and we're also thinking about, if, if it's possible, working with the shelters around Norfolk County. And where, where appropriate, if uh, the victim of domestic violence feels that for, uh, for them and their, their children, they would want a dog, kind of that built-in um, alarm system, if you will. Right. We, we have canine officers, so we're, we're exploring, it's in a discussion phase right now, having these unwanted shelter pets trained up by our canine officers and then placed uh, at no cost with victims of domestic violence. Great, because I, I know as somebody who owns a golden retriever, I don't need an alarm system. Nobody gets near my house without the dog going crazy. So 
improving the curriculum for inmates charged with or convicted of domestic violence? Yeah. So the education aspect? The, the education aspect is there. We have classes for them. Um, sadly, the pre-sentence population, not always, but sometimes is told by their defense attorneys, don't take those classes. Don't do something that almost looks like an admission of guilt. Oh, right? okay. Uh, because oftentimes they're coming and saying, it's her word against mine. Right. Um, I didn't do it. She's making it up. Um, so if you take those classes, it's almost an admission that, you know what, I do need help. I do need anger management classes. But we have a whole series of programming um, that abusers have to go through. Um, and when they're sentenced, they're more likely to take it. Uh, and we hope to turn, you know, turn their life around so that they can go out and be better people. Um, we're, we're big on getting people to reflect on what they've done while they're in our care and custody. We don't want them just sitting idly. Uh, doing their time. We want them in programming. Right. That makes sense because yeah. uh, there is that whole idea of rehabilitation it, and back out key. to the community. Yeah, amen. And that's why it's called the House of Corrections. Right. We're trying right. to correct that bad behavior and uh, we've got a great team up there that is trying to turn the tide. Talk about this. Quite a few senior programs or programs really dedicated toward seniors. And I know you have some literature here oh, that sure. you'll probably discuss. Uh, so Everyone knows that, or everyone thinks of a sheriff, and they think, okay, the inmates, the bad guys go there, they get locked up. Exactly. Right? We've covered that. But we have a lot of outward-facing programs. Um, so really outreach programs. Outreach programs. So the seniors uh, are always under attack from scam artists trying to call them, email them, send them snail mail, trying to get at their pocketbooks and their wallets. Um, we've heard of the, uh, the granny scams and the granddad scams where somebody will call them and say, their grandchild has uh, been arrested. They need to send out bail money and money for an attorney to get them out of trouble. And people fall for this. It's very sad. Um, actually, there was a case here in Quincy uh, not long ago where an astute taxi driver intercepted. Oh, correct. Uh, yeah, a woman was going to buy more gift cards, to, and she was going to re you know scratch the back off. There's a series of numbers on the back of those gift cards. That's like wiring the money out of your bank account. Right. Um, so when seniors get a phone call like that, we go out to all the councils on aging and we do a whole seminar uh, on senior safe strategies and how they should be aware of all these telephone scams, email scams, and snail mail scams. So uh, the granny granddad scam is probably the most prevalent. It's very cool. Uh, they'll play a hoax and have a, a young person call. They could say, I was in a car accident, so I sound a little funny, Grandma, because I broke my nose. Uh, but I'm going to put you on to this attorney who's going to bail me out and uh, you know, take care of the uh, court fees, but it's going to be $8,000. And, and folks do fall for that, sadly. So we get out to the Council on Aging. We tell the seniors all about that. But we also tell them about these great programs like Files for Life. Life-saving. Um, Life-saving. There's a little magnet strip on the back. This goes on the refrigerator. And first responders are trained to look for this. So it has all your pertinent medical information, uh, your, your medication and the dosage, uh, any allergies you may have, uh, any recent surgeries, or if you've got a heart, you know, an implant or something. Um, all this information is there to speak for you if, God forbid, you're incapacitated, if you're unconscious and you can't talk for yourself. This goes on the refrigerator. First responders know to look for it. A similar program that we do with Triad is called Yellow Dot. And it has all that pertinent information in your glove box with a photo ID. So that, it, again, if there's a motor vehicle accident, you can't speak for yourself, uh, there's a little yellow dot sticker that goes on the rear driver's side of your, your windshield. It tells first responders to look into the glove box. And in there, they know, uh, Mark, are you the driver? Or are you a passenger in that vehicle? And uh, basically, all of your information goes into this little packet with your picture. It's in the glove box, and again, first responders know, let's look for this and see, you know, do they have any allergies? What medications are they on? Uh, any recent surgeries? Next of kin, primary care physician. It's all there in one neat package. If we could uh, maybe hold up this oh, sure. brochure just oh, so yeah. folks can see the, I see the logo there you as got well. It. But the yellow the, dot. Um, one of the items I, I did want to um, call attention to is... Um, after we talk about this yellow dot program is the are you okay program yes. because we have that's a telephone uh, check-in service correct it's fantastic so uh, the this program is a, a 
It's a free program. All these programs are free to seniors. And this is a free program that's a partnership between Fallon Ambulance Service and the North County Sheriff's Office. Uh, and a lot of credit to my predecessor, Sheriff Mike Bellotti, former sheriff. Uh, he and uh, Cheryl Bambury from our office got together with this program, and it's saving lives. In the 12 months I've been sheriff, we've had seven saves. Excellent. And these are people who fell down, broke their wrist, couldn't hit their life alert uh, because the way they fell. One wrist was broken, a lot of broken hips, uh, and sadly one woman was in a bathtub for almost 11 hours, and she just lost the strength to get out of the tub. So the way the program works is between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., we'll generate a phone call out to the homes of those who have signed up. If they're okay, they just respond that they're okay. If they're not okay, they can ask for us you know, to send help, uh, which happened just recently. Somebody said they really didn't feel good. Uh, we asked, you, you know, do you want us to contact your son? Do you want us to send an ambulance? And they did, uh, and they're doing okay now. But uh, what will happen, Mark, is if, if, let's say you were signed up and you had a grandchild as your backup person, everyone must have a backup person, yeah. we'll call you. If you don't answer at that allotted time between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., let's say you've signed up and you want to call every day at 8.30, if we call and you don't pick up, we're going to call your backup person and say, is granddad there? Well, no, he left early. He's got a dentist appointment. Okay, not a, not a problem. But if we call you and you don't answer and your backup person says you should be there, we're going to call you one last time, and then we're going to do a wellness check. And again, seven people saved through this program. Um, and it's really a no-brainer. It's free. Um, and, and, you know, it, what I say to seniors when I go to the Council on Aging is it's a free program, it's peace of mind, and it's really peace of mind for your loved ones and a lot of people have children that live out of state who can't visit their elderly parents all the time. So it's, it's really a lifesaver. As we're talking about these senior programs, I guess it would be helpful to give out some information for folks to contact sure. the sheriff's office? Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you've got it on the screen there, but the main number is 781-751, I believe it's 3516. Um, yep, we've got it up there, 781-751-3516. There so all of those programs for seniors uh, that's available. You contact us. We also do a lot of programming around youth. Um, and and bef before yeah. we get to youth, I, I yeah. do want, um, there's a couple I, I didn't uh, recognize, uh, the YES program, the Y-E-S program. What is that exactly? That is also a senior it geared is. program. Yeah, y Youth Empowering Seniors. Oh, okay, yeah. youth are involved. Okay. Youth Empowering Seniors. It's a terrific program. And um, just think of somebody my mom's age, 93 years old, if you gave them a smartphone for the first time, they'll probably figure out how to make phone calls and a few other things. But there's so much technology packaged in there that they need some help. Of course. Right? I need help. Yeah, I need help. <laughs> Thank God I have two teenage daughters. I but to my 15-year-old to yeah, help me. <laughs> I do. 16 and 17-year-old, I just hand them the phone and say, help me. Right. Um, and they do, and they can. And they can. And that's what this program is. It's Youth Empowering Seniors. Showing them the phone, showing them on a laptop other features, how to, how to Skype how to use FaceTime, uh, if they get turned around and they're a little disoriented, how they can use GPS to get back home. Um, what, what happens is while the, say the, the uh, high schooler, you know, sophomore, junior, senior in high school is teaching that elderly person how to use the technology on the smartphone, they're also becoming friends. And it's almost like a new adopted uh, grandmother or grandfather, and there's a bond, an intergenerational bond, which is terrific. Right. And what we do at the end of the program is we give everyone a certificate for their participation, and we find out that they've now made a great friendship that's going to be there for the rest of their lives. Um, and we had people in Randolph actually crying because, uh, you know, if, if they didn't have a grandmom or granddad that was alive, this is their new adopted grandparent, uh, and they learn a lot from that senior. Uh, one of my mom's favorite sayings is, you can't put an old head on young shoulders. And it's, so it's that wisdom from folks in the greatest generation that they're imparting to these high schoolers. And here it is the whole time the high schooler thought they were teaching the seniors. It's a two-way street. It's a two-way street, and it's a terrific program. Now, you also have uh, featured speakers that, uh, again, go out um, to, I assume, senior centers. We do. We do. Um, so uh, a lot of things that we do around the seniors and the youth is we'll have um, tours. People come up to the House of Correction, and they'll do a tour. And part of that, Mark, is when they come in, we'll bring uh, a couple of inmates out and we'll go into the library and they'll do a, a question and answer series. Oh, so they go there? They go there. But we also make sure, uh, you know, we get somebody through classification that's safe and 
uh, low flight risk and uh, you know they're not a security threat we'll bring that person out that inmate out with us and we'll go around to the council on aging we'll go to high schools we'll go to middle schools and it's very impactful because they're hearing from an inmate who not that long ago may have sat in that middle school or that high school um, and the teachers love it and the parents love it because the kids are listening they're listening to somebody say stay on the right path well it's first-hand experience first-hand experience don't make the mistakes i made and here's how i ended up in the house of correction the seniors love it because they're getting a kind of an eye-opening experience as to what's really going on with this opioid epidemic why are so many young people when i talk to seniors it's sad mark people come up after after our um our talk and they'll pull me aside and they'll say you know yeah my grandson my granddaughter they got in, they got hooked on pills and now they're on heroin um so it, it's affecting everybody in every community. I was going to say almost everybody knows of someone everybody. or multiple people. Yeah. No, it's very sad. And you see more grandparents raising their grandkids because of this opioid crisis. One last time, that number at the bottom of the screen is 781-751-3516. And I do want to go back to youth specific and talk about yeah. the youth leadership program. This one is terrific. Um, it's actually an, an academy. It's an academy. So uh, campers come, uh, young people come to this in Braintree, and we have a ropes course, an obstacle course, and most of the kids who come, that's exactly what they want to do. They want to go, uh, you know, take the uh, pulley line. It's almost like treetop adventures. It's quite impressive. It, I've, I've seen it in It's incredible. Um, but what they don't realize, and it happens slowly during the week, is their self-esteem is growing. What they're gaining. What they're gaining. Uh, new friendships. They're kind of coming out of their shell. They're, they're gaining confidence. Um, but the other thing is we, we have a very um, good way over the week of I interjecting into the curriculum anti-bullying strategies. And that's terrific because at the end of the week, when we have the pizza party and they get their certificate, their graduation certificate, and parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts come, we talk about bullying. And we often do a show of hands. Um, and it's sad. You know, bullying yeah. is an epidemic, too. It is, and has uh, resulted in, uh, most recently, folks will, uh, watching the news, will see court cases where uh, someone, in fact, has died because of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it is sad. And with these smartphones, it cuts both ways, right? So technology is terrific. But uh, probably in our day, when we went to school, if there was bullying, at least it ended when the school bell rang. Kids could go home go to the, you know, the sanctity of their home and, and, and take a break. It's ever present It's now. ever present with these smartphones and people pile on. Kids are very brave behind a, a smartphone and multiple kids will pile on and pile on and it gets very nasty. And um, it, you know, it's something that we have to talk about in the middle schools and in the high schools. Um, so we do that as part of the Leadership Academy in Braintree, which has um, grown and grown and grown over the years. It's to the point now where don't be surprised in the future if we have to look around Norfolk County and see if we can replicate that camp somewhere else because we're actually turning families, campers away. That's how desirable this, um, this program is. So it, it's packed every summer. You should, maybe we could do a show uh, or get a camera At down the there Academy. some Friday. Yeah, or Definitely. during the week and see the kids build up that self-confidence uh, in the teamwork because you have to actually trust your team to catch you on a pulley line if you fall. It's like a bungee cord. Uh, but these kids really, you know, they overcome their fears and um, they've changed by the end of the week. And is there a number for the youth programs or could folks dial the they, same number? They could dial that same number and we'll get them over to our Leadership Academy folks, uh, Paula Glenn and Matt Lowe over in Braintree. So 781-751-3516. Great. We should also mention you are available as so many people oh, sure. are on the web. Absolutely. Yeah, they can check us out at uh, NorfolkSheriff.org. Um, you know, any questions they have, they can call up in the main number. Um, we're happy to answer any questions and give tours, um, not just to the middle school and high school and our councils on aging, but other groups. Rotary clubs have come, chambers of commerce. So uh, we're we very have, open. I should mention we have NorfolkSheriff.com. Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. Dot com. Okay. Yeah. I want to thank you for uh, coming in and uh, sharing thank you. Uh, kind of a, yeah. an overview about the Norfolk County Sheriff's Office and certainly welcome you back to talk thank about you. specific programs uh, in the future like the Youth Leadership Academy. Great. Great. Mark, thanks pleasure. so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.